Hey, everybody. Really excited about this interview. It's with a former leader of the Aryan Brotherhood. I've had Michael Thompson on for a previous interview. And in this interview, he answers a lot of the questions that you had for follow-up. So it's going to be a really interesting, informative interview. But before we get to that, I want you to know that in August, I'm going to be doing a live stream. It's the first time I've ever done a live stream of our seminar, the two-day foundational seminar. Never been done before. It's at a ridiculously low price because I want you to give me feedback on our new live stream studio. Please take advantage of that. This uh, offer is in the show notes below. But sign up soon because we've only got 50 slots left. I've already done this to my list. They filled it up. I've got 50 slots for all my YouTubers. So please take advantage of this and uh, go to the link, go to the show link, and sign up for it right away. Uh, you will not be disappointed. Again, it's exciting for me because uh, live stream is really becoming the way that I'm contacting most people now after, after COVID. It just is the reality. And so uh, I've made the investment to a very good studio. And I want your feedback, and I want you to experience what it's like to go through live training with us. Okay, now, on to the interview. Uh, most people were really surprised the first time I had Michael Thompson on. As a matter of fact, I didn't even list him by name or the organization that he used to be with, the Aryan Brotherhood, on the last one. I put it under the heading of the best self-defense information you'll never hear. If you have not heard that interview, you should really go back to it and listen to it. It's fantastic. Michael really goes in depth about his background, recruitment, and a lot of the actual violence that he experienced on the, on the yard. In this interview, we go more in depth talking about the challenges of being behind the bars and how you operate within an organization and how you lead in an organization and how violence is that overriding, you know, power structure that gives you the ability to, you know, control federal prisons, basically, as inmates. Really, really interesting. Also shares some very interesting information about Charles Manson and Sirhan Sirhan, the assassin who uh, shot Bobby Kennedy. Very, very interesting. Now, listen, I have to tell you, Michael uh, right now is going through some legal challenges. Uh, he just recently got out and then got into another legal issue with the state of California, and it's hard for him to get on the Internet. So the interview that we did is fantastic. I will say that the audio is off. There was something during the exchange, I don't know if it was Michael's hookup or something on the software, but it, the audio is a little bit disjointed. You can still hear everything. It's just visually sometimes it looks like one of those old kung fu movies where the audio comes out and then the, the mouth moves. But I looked at it twice and realized that the information is so good that I didn't want to wait. So uh, I'm putting this out. So I'm just saying ahead of time, yes, I realize there's some audio uh, disjointment but it's worth it. So without further ado, Michael Thompson. Michael, great to have you back on the show. It's good to be here, Tim. Good to see you. You know, we, uh, in, in our last conversation, um, we had a lot of feedback from that. And um, mm -hmm. if anybody that has not seen, um, uh, my first interview with Michael, I will have, make sure it's in the show notes and I would definitely, um, make sure that everybody you know, goes to see that to get really good background on mm. a lot of what we talked about, but the follow-up from that, you know, for those that are new to you, if they're just watching this one, the first time, obviously you were, you were convicted as a young man, uh, mm. of two murders that, uh, you still to this day, uh, you know, are, are fighting, you know, mm. the, the actual, you know, you, uh, you know, being blamed for those. Mm -hmm. um, but you were thrown right into the system. Poor, mm -hmm. you know, your, your legal counsel was, was minimal at that time. And you went right in and you were, you were thrown into some really serious um, places up front. Mm -hmm. You uh, had to f literally fight for your life. Yes. Um, you were naturally, you know, because of your upbringing mm -hmm. and your mentor who taught you very well, uh, you were, you were surprisingly very good at taking care of yourself in that environment. They probably weren't used to somebody new like you coming in uh, oh, unknown. Yeah. 
-hmm. in dealing with that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more because people were really interested in how, you know, I want to talk about more about your training also um, mm -hmm. that, that you, that you receive, but what was it like, you know, can you give people back then? And I know things have changed, but can you give people an idea of what it was like to come in to a new organization like this, the Aryan Brotherhood, which is uh, back then it was pretty exclusive uh, amongst, you know, the prisoners to even be invited to something like that. And then how you ascended to basically one of the main shot callers and what that was like and, and how at the inception of your membership, I guess, mm -hmm. um, what you were trying to achieve and then how that worked out. I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. They're trying to say that, do, that you, yeah. you became a major leader in, in mm -hmm. this. You were very influential. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is that like, you know, to go from just a brand new person, you know, uh, I think you called yourself a fish yes. when, you, when you came in, it was the term. And then you mm -hmm. ascend to this position of leadership that's recognized not only in that prison, but throughout the whole system. Right. What's it like to have that kind of power in there? And what's it like to go through that? Yeah, it, it's actually what I refer to as a power base. And of course, I didn't understand it within that construct at the time. Um, what I was dealing with was, as you correctly point out, survival. And um, when I got to Old Folsom, I was uh, initially recruited by the Black Panthers and uh, declined. And then um, uh, T.D. Bingham with the, uh, the brand, Aryan Brotherhood, uh, he approached me with the same idea of recruiting me into the brand. I had no idea that it, um, many, many people were attempting uh, to enter into the, the Brotherhood. Um, and, but there was very few people uh, who were actual members. And there was a reason for that. It, um, it required an individual that uh, had the capacity and the ability not only for physical prowess, but um, the ability to control his environment by himself. Um, it wasn't a group type dynamic. Um, the whole idea behind the recruitment process where we're selecting individuals that uh, could not only handle themselves physically, but uh, had the capacity to control, literally control their environment by themselves. And of course, <clears throat> excuse me, with that, uh, that control, uh, there's no bluff, you have to be able to back it up, is really what it comes what it comes down to. So my introduction into the brand, I initially declined uh, their invitation to join, I didn't know that that was unheard of, but um, I declined. And that was primarily because of my perception of the brand at the time that they were racist, and um, they were all dope fiends. I don't use drugs, never have. And I'm certainly not racist. So, uh, and, you know, the individual T.D. Bingham, who was recruiting me at the time, he attempted to explain and I just shut him down. And, uh, but it was later that uh, four Native Americans who were also Aryan Brotherhood, they approached me. And um, they, they got at me in a really good way. They, they, they knew that I grew up on a reservation. And so um, they simply told me, you know, we know you're a res dog. And, uh, but you need to understand that we live better in here than we ever did on the res. Now that really piqued my curiosity. And so it was, I said, what do you mean? And um, so they went on to explain how they controlled the resources. Um, and by that, I mean that uh, there's a misconception, I think, on the part of the public, even all the way back then that, uh, you know, you have a warden and associate wardens and captains and lieutenants and officers. And the perception is, is that they control the prison. Even they used to say, we control the perimeter. We keep you from escaping. And what goes on inside the prison is really up to you guys. Um, and that's the way it was. So that uh, the brand, for instance, at Folsom um, controlled all the jobs, the placement of all those jobs um, from the uh, prison uh, industry authority, which was a license plate factory at, at Folsom, but to kitchen workers, to porters, uh, ground crew, um, essentially, you name it, clerks, so that if I wanted myself, for instance, ducketed uh, to a particular area to meet with somebody else, the clerks would facilitate that for me. But it was more than that, you had a population of 1000s. And so you were controlling them also via uh, drug trafficking, uh, prostitution, um, loan sharking, 
um, even the sale of alcohol, um, pretty much anything you can you can think of. It was like a small city. And so when you have control of those resources, um, that gives you your power base. It's an economic power base really is what it is. Uh, the problem with the brand at that time, um, at least from my perception, was that all of them were dope fiends. In other words, they were generating tens of thousands of dollars, but all, it was, all of it was going into their arms. And that just didn't make any sense to me. So uh, one of the first things that I did upon accepting membership into the brand is I began to talk with others like T.D. Bingham, who was very influential within the brand, about restructuring your organization towards uh, really an organized crime faction, uh, where you're generating revenues, profits, and then you're reinvesting those profits towards legitimate enterprise. And, um, you know, that resonated. The idea that, you know, you could not only create uh, legitimate businesses on the street, and then when individuals parole put them in place, by way of a, a job structure, but take care of their families, purchase homes, vehicles, money in the bank, and so on, as opposed to just simply shooting it away into the arms of, of the membership. And, um, you know, that resonated with TD and others. Uh, I think some were caught up in just the very idea of going toward more toward organized crime. Right. And, um, but the as you and I, I think, have discussed previously, the, the primary currency um, within that environment was violence. Right. And uh, that's something that um, the Aryan Brotherhood held a large stake in. Well, um, was that something, you know, because obviously they were around prior to you joining. Is, right. was, that, was that from the very beginning? Was that how they, they knew they could distinguish themselves? Is that because obviously their population wise, the whites weren't the largest group. No, actually but the smallest. Smallest, yeah. Yeah, but, but you're right. Um, initially what happened is that you had uh, other factions that aren't considered prison gangs, like the neo-Nazis, for instance. Right. And um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, what would happen, and what actually did happen, um, was that the neo-Nazis would incite, instigate, with their hate talk, uh, whether against Jews or blacks or whatever it was. But in this case, say, I'll just use my own example at San Quentin, um, they would pretty much talk out the side of their neck relative to inciting um, a race war. And then when it came time for that race war to happen, they were nowhere to be found. So what that did is it made the rest of the white population extremely vulnerable and, and they were preyed upon right. by some very, very angry blacks. Um, so the function of the Aryan Brotherhood at that time was to step in to that void and essentially tell the blacks, you're not going to do this, but also to turn around and um, hold the neo-Nazis accountable, which I did. Um, I'll just tell you point blank, I can't stand them. Um, you know, by my estimation, Hitler was the original jawjacker. And uh, it's what I refer to as people who just can't help themselves. They just got to jack their jaw, no matter what the subject is. And um, the neo-Nazis were the same way. They're just jaw jackers. And, but very good at inciting violence against the white population. So members of the Aryan Brotherhood formed and stepped in um, to essentially provide protection um, to the rest of the white population. Tell the rest of the races, back up. Deal with your own, handle your own, but you leave the whites alone. So as a result of that, that gave them their standing uh, within uh, Old Folsom and San Quentin, um, standing to control uh, the population, which they did. Um, and that's what I mean by controlling their resources. Uh, that's essentially what it was, was controlling their resources. So. Um, I've mentioned before that uh, I think the FBI estimated in 1978 I took uh, 3.5 million out of Folsom alone. And uh, it doesn't sound like a lot of money by today's standards, but back in 1978, it was a lot, particularly coming up out of prison. Yeah. So the idea was, was to take um, those revenues and give them practical application towards a business enterprise. And uh, that's really my initial function as a leader within the Aryan Brotherhood was a restructuring process. Um, eventually, would outlaw drugs, the use of drugs, 
Now, when I say outlaw, they had a choice. They could use drugs, but if they did, they needed to understand that they were expendable. In other words, when a situation arose where um, something needed to be done and it was uh, rather iffy or it was a slippery slope of some kind, then they were considered expendable and they were sent on that mission um, because they had made it clear that their use of drugs was more important than their commitment to the organization. That, that, that was a strategic, that's a, a interesting strategic, strategic move. It's their choice. Mm -hmm. So you made yes. it their choice. They didn't, yes. they didn't do it, but it's also for, from the organization standpoint, it's really useful because you can then take somebody who now has chosen drugs over the organization to, to do the, the frontline work that may or may not be, um, you don't want to put, you don't want to put a brother in good standing who's useful um mm -hmm. to do that job if you can, if you have somebody else that can you know get the job done but you don't worry about the outcome well it was really a matter of, just, of discernment and it went across the board for instance you know you hear a lot about this blood in blood out um the vast majority of that construct is nonsense i'll just put it out there i mean it sounds good but um you if you put the knife in the hand of an individual to go handle somebody head up Back then, everything was head up. There were no, no assassinations. Um, you're setting him up for failure because he's not trained to fight with a knife. Um, so what you do is you look at what other um, attributes he might have otherwise uh, that he could bring to the organization, um, You know, whether it's clerking or, or moving drugs or prostitution, pimping, whatever it may be, as opposed to imposing upon him that requirement that you know he... Um, go head up with somebody. So the point was, was to create really a cadre system um, that you had a nucleus of individuals that represented the hierarchy, if you will, of the Aryan Brotherhood. And then you had a buffer system of circles that expanded out. And depending on how close that circle was to the nucleus, depended on uh, how much interaction they had. And it created a buffer system, but it also effectively utilized those individuals as a resource for the organization in a capacity that they were competent with, right. as opposed to just violence. That's right. just good business. Right. And, and you have this, uh, you developed individuals, you know, a, a lot, you know, obviously like yourself who went to the top, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you, the, the Aaron Brotherhood was known for, for developing those. I, I don't even know the right term for it. The, you know, super alphas that literally when they tried at one point, when they thought they were going to break you guys up and they put you in other mm -hmm. prisons, they had no idea what they were doing. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they have individuals that literally one guy walking in mm -hmm. has is trained to be able to go in through his force of personality, his ability to get things done, obviously, you know, judiciously using violence when he needs to, mm -hmm. um, but could literally take over at that point. And yeah. what, what, how did you guys cultivate individuals like that? Obviously, some of it obviously is known, like they, they, they recognized it in you. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine probably when you get to the top leadership, most of those guys probably naturally had a lot of the attributes, and then the organization gave them the rest. But how did how did you I guys, did you guys constantly looking for people like that? Uh, yes. I mean, it's, it's, they have to come essentially of their own volition. You know, you don't typically recruit. You don't go out looking for individuals in that capacity. And if you do, it's at a lesser level. Right. That's how the uh, Nazi lowriders were formed. Uh, they were created as essentially a vanguard to put out in front of the organization itself. Right. But insofar as the membership itself and, and, and the recruitment, if you will, of, of that membership, more times than not, I'd say 99% of the time, uh, that individual comes of his own volition and um, exemplifies those characteristics that he thinks will best serve the organization and um, presents himself uh, as um, a competent um, attribute to the organization. Uh, and then of course that has to be demonstrated. So if he's demonstrative in that um, consistently over a course of time, um, then back then a vote would be taken insofar as bringing him in. But it, you know, you mentioned the idea of, of breaking up the organization and moving them out to other prisons and, and had law enforcement in general shared their intelligence, they would have understood 
um, the structure of the organization itself. But one of the modalities that I incorporated, particularly at Folsom, was counterintelligence, so that I discerned um, who their conduits were, who was feeding them information about the organization. So once I had figured that out, I would feed them misinformation and then see how that went through the cycle and how it came back to me, who it came back to me through. And that would pretty much tell me who I was dealing with. So that, you know, by the time I stepped away from the brand, the intelligence that uh, the law enforcement community had um, was extremely faulty. Um, but the point is, is that had they done their homework, so to speak, um, I'll take that even a step further. Had they not been so arrogant right. in, dealing, in dealing with the gang, um, they would have been up on the fact that by um, moving individuals into other prisons, including the federal prisons, and they were actually assisting us yeah. um, in our networking process. Um, but that, that's a huge factor. Um, you know, one, the fact that, that uh, the law enforcement community does not share intelligence, um, and they should. Uh, and then two, um, they're so-called experts um, and the information that they derive that really establishes their so-called expertise, uh, the vast majority of which is faulty. Um, by design, but uh, they so underestimated the individuals that they were dealing with, um, and that's why I use the term arrogance, um, that they just assumed that they had a lock-in insofar as their understanding of the infrastructure of the organization, when in fact they did not. You know, it's, it's funny, uh, in my dealings with corrections, <clears throat> mm -hmm. There are some there are some guys doing some good work. Um, yes. It's interesting. They what their complaint is is the sharing that, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's so much that you can call from studying, you know, the prison gangs and how they operate, and it affects what's going on out in the streets. But there's there seems to be. I, I was shocked when I had some conversations with some people back in D.C. who were supposed mm -hmm. to be on top of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And just some of the stuff I was sharing them from my interviews and, and what I've done, I really realized nobody's talking to anybody, like, mm -hmm. like not, not at the level you think they were, because there's mm -hmm. great intelligence that you can pull out of, of that. And, but it's like you said, it's, uh, there's assumptions made mm -hmm. that I, I guess because you're in prison, like somehow they can just dismiss intelligence, like, like, oh, well, you know, they're, they're not, they don't. Yeah. They don't understand what they're up against. I have found like a lot of the people that I've dealt with, you know, like yourself and other people um, mm -hmm. that I've interviewed, it's uh, the, the intelligence level is, is mm -hmm. impressive. And the application, what's so interesting about talking to people and again, not validating the criminal aspect of it. I'm just no. thinking from a human nature aspect. Mm -hmm. The fact that you guys are operating, when I say you guys, I mean anybody who, who reaches a level of leadership like you did in, in that mm -hmm. system, you do so much with so little. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, it's worth study because mm -hmm. like I, I've told people, the vetting process that I've seen done to, you know, the, that, that the prison gangs do for their leadership and who's in, who gets placed where, far superior to anything I've seen, like for corporate vetting of, uh, you know, people for corporate positions and stuff like that. And I mean, the, out here in the, out, out in the, you know, in the corporate world, they spend literally millions of dollars with yeah. headhunters and people like that. And yet the vetting that you guys do, because you don't have anywhere to go, if something goes wrong, mm -hmm. meaning you have to police yourselves. It, it's, it's really interesting how, how, how you guys look at all that. Well, the difference is that economic base. You can go into any corporation and you'll find that your economic base is predicated upon a hierarchy. And that hierarchy is also predicated upon the earning potential of that individual in place, whether it's the CEO or COO, whatever it may be. And oftentimes the misconception that that represents an alpha male, and it does not. You know, the, the ability and the capacity to generate revenues is great, but that does not make you an alpha male. Uh, within a controlled environment in prison, 
the, the dynamic is, is much more severe. It, it goes way beyond just generating an economic base, although that's a critical part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the capacity and the intellect associated with the ability to do that is important uh, because that generates resources. But it goes much far beyond that. I mean, just take the idea of convict ingenuity. And that's really what you're talking about when you're talking about being in a controlled environment and how you have to adapt. And adaptation is the key. So you have limited resources. It's how you use those resources. When you have individuals who have nothing else to do all day, but sit around and think about ways to beat the system and how you do that effectively, not only for the purposes of generating an economy or an economic base, um, but circumventing the system itself whether it's beating metal detectors, whether it's smuggling guns in, you know, long before there were cell phones, I had CB radios that I used in all the units. And I was in the hole communicating with all my members, you see, but the idea you tell somebody that and they think, oh, that's absurd. You couldn't do that. Well, yes, you can, you see, but it's the assumption that you can't that makes the difference. When it mm -hmm. comes to the arrogance side of it, it's funny you're saying that because down, you know, do, doing the work I did down in South America, you know, you look in the prisons, mm -hmm. cell phones, everything, just it's all, you know, it's mm -hmm. all part of the game. I think the arrogance was they thought, oh, well, that doesn't happen in the U.S. You know, our prisons, mm -hmm. we don't run things that way. Right. Not true. Not true at all. You know, yeah. I, I, like I said, uh, the ingenuity is amazing. Um, that I think one of the, the things that. Uh, is really useful for people to understand is that the these organizations they have everything on running the economics of of, of their situation is there but the the unique thing is it truly is backed up with violence you know yes. like meaning to I mean the violence is a currency the credible threat and you know judicious use of it and when i say judicious i don't mean uh judicious in the legal sense i mean you have no. to be you guys also have to be very thoughtful in how you use violence right. because you can get everything shut down which is not the goal right. the goal is not to shut down you know your con your prison economy and so you have to be very creative on how and when you can use violence and make sure that people aren't going off doing their own thing when it comes to uh that's the why, use of violence yeah tim you're right it's why you don't have fist fights in prison right. the fist fights get in the way of the very things you're talking about business and, um, you know, whether it be race related or, or otherwise, you don't allow it. And so your respective groups racially control that for that reason. If something rises to the point where real violence is involved, that's an entirely different thing. You know, if that's a matter of territory, if it's a matter of resources, uh, the infringement upon those resources. Uh, but, you know, this idea of disrespect and somebody's been slighted and so you're going to kill this person over something those things don't happen they're not allowed to happen uh, because it gets in the way of business of course you know by way of intelligence you'll have um staff attempt to incite to put people at odds um you know that's part of the game but everyone understands that um and again you know we're talking about staff as if um there's something wrong with them, you know, and I want to emphasize the fact that I know a lot of staff that are extremely competent, very professional, and uh, that I admire and respect um, for their ethics um, and their sense of morality. Um, many, many of them, some of whom are still my friends out here on the street. So uh, I don't want to give the impression that um, staff in general are a, bun a bunch of bumpkins. They're not. Yeah. You know, you have uh, a few individuals, um, oftentimes, you know, we're always going to be dealing with egos, but, you know, part of the training of the Aryan Brotherhood is how to psychologically contend with an individual who has um, a problem with ego strength, let's say, you know, or self-image, or he wears his badge across his chest. So, you, you know, you're actually looking for those kind of individuals so that you can manipulate them and use them or feed them in some capacity that benefits the organization. But for the most part, um, those individuals who are in control are intelligent and resourceful and really know what the game is. Um, 
you know, the only criticism I have uh, in that is their, their, their refusal to share intelligence. It just amazed me. Um, you know, and then the idea that, you know, the individuals you're dealing with aren't intelligent enough or smart to compete with or contend with um, law enforcement in general. Uh, you know, I oftentimes tell the story about uh, being in the San Bernardino jail, and uh, I use the subpoena process to bring the membership over, fill 20 cells, and uh, cut all the doors out of the cells and the back out and was getting ready to go out the window. And there was a situation that stopped that and I put a stop to it. But the point is, is that, you know, jail commander came in and he was talking to me and he was, um, I was in the end cell and I just cut the bars out of the plates. Uh, on where his hand was resting, you know, and he was standing there tell, telling me how stupid I was. And I just said, yes, sir, you're absolutely correct. You know, Crazy. And, that's just that they, they don't, um, that the manipulation, like, like it was fascinating, you know, reading mm -hmm. the original, the original um, um, article that I read about the brand, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of predicated everything. And then since then I found the documentaries uh, that you were involved in and stuff. What's interesting was I, I just it struck me just the use of the intelligent use of the system against itself, the way you mm -hmm. guys were able to literally have meetings and, and call mm -hmm. each other as witnesses and yes. all of that. And there's nothing they could do about it. It was mm -hmm. it was it was amazing how you guys used what you could use mm -hmm. to the fullest on that. And yes. I think that's something that that people just don't understand in an environment like that, the power of really the, the human mind is amazing. Like you said, you have all day to think about it, you know, obviously mm -hmm. in using that time and you guys came up with very creative, effective ways to communicate and to use the system to your benefit at times. It really is a matter of schooling. I mean, as you know, when I came into the system, I couldn't read or write, but eventually I did and I put myself through college and um, at my expense, not the state's. But the point is, is that what higher education teaches you is how to research. I, I really think that's the only value in higher education. Yeah. And diplomas are nice and all that, but they're just a piece of paper. And, and, and if that works for you, then that's great. But the point is, is what all higher education does is it teaches you uh, how to research a subject. So with that ability, you know, I moved right into the law and started researching the law. And so when you understand the law, and of course, reasonable minds differ, that's a primary dictum in the law. But when you understand how the law works, and how you can utilize it to your benefit, like the subpoena process, you know, that's really not that difficult to understand. Right. But pursuant to the law, it's the requirement, it's the constitutional right to do that. So you're essentially usurping um, what would otherwise be a legitimate a constitutional right to facilitate the activities of the gang. Um, and it was very, very effective and continues to be effective because nothing has been done to stop it. Um, and, there, and that's true in, in many areas, actually. One of the questions that was asked after our last interview was mm -hmm. um, the concept, that it's mentioned in that article in The New Yorker uh, that I said, and then uh, briefly in your documentary, uh, when you were being interviewed, they, you didn't say this. They said it. They, they said that um, <clears throat> that the brand, you know, really counseled members to understand human anatomy for the purposes of, you know, violence and killing, uh, mainly because, you know, there had been a situation where um, a, a sanctioned assassination was unsuccessful and that help got there, the, the staff got there before the person that that was being targeted was killed. Can you mm -hmm. talk to that as far as it, because it's not just, it's also been said that the Mexican mafia, other interviews I've seen, same thing that anatomy of the human body is something that seems to be at the highest level, something that at least is considered and looked at um, in, in some way, shape or form. It's, it's the differentiation when we, when we look at a lot of other, the, the psychological training that you guys do amongst yourselves, the books that you read, everything. The one thing that is really unique is that even in the law enforcement world and the um, uh, special operations world, where I deal with a lot of people and a lot of training, mm -hmm. anatomy is not in that. It, it's, it's kind of unique to the prison, uh, the prison mm -hmm. culture as far as that. And, and can you talk to, you know, what, what your impression is of that 
Um, sure. Part. I'm a biologist by training. That's the study of life. So when you're dealing with training individuals to take somebody out as efficiently, effectively, and quickly as possible, uh, then anatomy becomes critical to that, striking points and otherwise, whether they just be striking points with a hand or striking points with a knife, or whatever it may be. Um, but that's a time factor. It's, it's really a point of time management. So Gray's Anatomy, the text Gray's Anatomy was mandatory. And I made it mandatory for that reason. Um, you know, oftentimes, if you just look at artists in the history of, of mankind, uh, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and what they did with cadavers toward their understanding of just art, right? Uh, you know, sculpture, and, um, you know, effectively um, converting that uh, to their work of art. So it's the same in warfare, it's the same in combat, in fighting, you know, your strike points, depending on the discipline that you adhere to. But Strike points are pretty basic, you know, the temple area relative to dropping somebody immediately, um, going up underneath the ribs to the heart of the lungs, popping a lung from the side, a kidney, um, all these bleeding individual, uh, where the main arteries are at, and so on. Um, the purpose of, uh, for the anatomy of the eye, you know, uh, what it will resist and what it won't resist. Um, you know, the sac that surrounds the heart. You know, depending on where you strike, that sack will move. Um, so, you know, going between the ribs, um, the spinal cord, and the effect of uh, severing the spinal cord. Um, those, to me, um, as a warrior, um, are critical components of understanding what you're doing and how effectively you're going to do it. Yeah. Uh, when, in, when any of us train in, in martial arts, um, that's essentially what we're training for. It's not just a strike point for the purposes of striking that person there. It has a specific effect, impact upon that person, that, and that's its intent, you know, whether with the hand or the foot, whatever it may be. And um, the, the, the modality, the method of striking also becomes important. You know, you, you can, um, a chest punch, for instance, you know, heart punch is what it's called. Um, you know, a strike to the throat. You know, the, the function of the larynx, uh, the carotid artery, uh, the jugular vein, um, all those things become critical. You know, what's the pressure uh, associated with that? How many pounds does it take? And um, so that if you're, if you're working out, if you're lifting weights, that's to increase your strength. But the effective utilization of that strength um, is determined by your ability to strike and to strike um, appropriately. Um, you know as well as I do that if you attempt to execute a strike that um, is technically uh, wrong, that it's not going to have the same effect right. on the strike point. Um, whether it be open-handed, the heel of your hand or a fist, the side of your hand, whatever it may be. And so the anatomy is really just a critical component um, of holistically approaching the idea of combat. Yeah, it, it's funny that that seems to have been lost, I think, because <clears throat> um, we're so focused on the outside here, people are more focused on the tools, they're more focused on, mm -hmm. you know, firearms or or what they're mm -hmm. carrying. Um, and the idea of training the brain and body first, I think mm -hmm. is really fallen by the wayside. But what's interesting is, you know, in a, a social environment, like a like a prison, you know, that you're in there, and you have to go back to the basics. And, you know, your brain and body is your first line of defense. Um, yeah. It's amazing how quickly people go back to that mm -hmm. and how they share knowledge and what works and what doesn't work. But it all comes down to like the same, the thing is the human body, you know, has these areas that no matter how much somebody conditions themselves or does whatever they try to do, you know, fitness wise, mm -hmm. there's still vulnerable areas. And the fact that, sure. that you, that, that you guys realize that, you know, mm -hmm. early on. And you said, you said another thing that's interesting too, you said, you know, as a warrior, and that's exactly how, you know, everybody I talked to in, in, you know, in the prison uh, system, the gang system mm -hmm. that they're, they're in there, that's it. It gives a mission and a purpose. You, it, it, it's, you know, you're in this place and you're stuck there for whatever your term is. And, you know, it's really easy to lose hope and lose 
there. And, and what I don't think a lot of people understand is the fact that the mission and purpose of the gang, even if it's seen from the outside as being, oh my God, this is horrible, you know, what these guys are doing. Um, it, it allows you to have that, you know, I mean, what I was amazed is what that status of thinking of yourself in that ability, what, what these guys have been able to do with these limited resources. It's you've really produced from the outside. Again, this is not glorifying it. It's just a reality. You produce some really incredible individuals mm -hmm. um, that you were smart enough to create a purpose and a mission for them. Yeah, it, it really, if you stop and think about it, I'm some, may take umbrage at what I'm about to say, but whether military or law enforcement in general, their approach is the same. I mean, their conditioning is for that reason, you know, to optimize that individual's potential for the task at hand. And more times than not, that task at hand is violence, particularly in the military. But you have paramilitary groups that employ the same tactics uh, and strategy, you know, and it's like anything else. Uh, you, you can have a plan, but it's important to understand that the strategy changes from day to day. And, and you have to improvise oftentimes with that uh, so that preparedness becomes critical to that. And that preparedness has always been, to my way of thinking, uh, holistic. So, you know, just as an alcohol and drug counselor now, excuse me, I emphasize, um, you know, that biopsychosocial spiritual component toward recovery and addiction. I took a fourfold approach in the training that I instituted for combat. You know, it's the same, you know, it's like you're talking about, you know, we now know that it is not the brain that speaks to the body. It's the body that speaks to the brain. Um, and that's important. I mean, you can break it all the way down to um, DNA sequencing, you know, relative to that, um, you know, your, your heritage and um, what exists within you by way of potential and bringing that potential out bringing it out through exercise, bringing it out through diet, bringing it out through education. You see, then if you have a, a spiritual foundation, you know, in, in the context of a warrior, that would be more important as it relates to a code, you know, a, a code of ethics. And people oftentimes say, what do you mean? These are, these are brutal human beings who kill people and the code of ethics that doesn't exist. It does exist. Leastwise it did in my day. Right. And, um, you know, if, if you're, if you're fashioning your structure along the lines of say Masuchi and uh, you know, the book of five rings, he was, right, uh, he, right. he owned the school of two swords right. and you read someone like him and you think, okay, you know, what did he employ holistically, you know, towards his practice. And then you take someone like Sun Tzu, um, you know, and hit the elements philosophically, not practically, but philosophically of what's important. So you're getting that psychological component, you know, know your enemy, know your terrain, ultimate victories without bloodshed, infiltration, so that uh, having infiltrated when the time comes, you've already won. You see, and that's the essence of counterintelligence, if you stop and think about it. So it's coupling these things together. It's, it's like putting together a puzzle. There's real, no, no real mystery here, but it's recognizing um, those components designer specifically in each individual, and then cultivating those. And then from that, you're going to get uh, the best result, in my opinion, as opposed to one size fits all. Because if you attempt to train an individual along a course that is not compatible with who he is, um, biologically, physiologically, psychologically, even within the social construct, um, you're not going to optimize his potential. So it's a, it's a really a matter of optimizing that potential by recognizing um, the potential in the individual. And um, so again, that's across the board. So, you know, everybody can read Machiavelli and get something different from it. Right. You know, right. you, same with uh, Nietzsche. But as I've so often said, you know, Frederick Nietzsche was a brilliant, brilliant man. I mean, philosophically, you know, and all philosophy deals with the human condition. That's the important thing to understand about philosophy. The problem with people like Friedrich Nietzsche is that he was a worm of a man. Yeah. I mean, he was incapable of practicing essentially that which he was um, preaching. The Ubermensch is a good example. You know, the Superman. 
but um, <clears throat> not so with Masucci. You know, here was a man that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, was well trained of his own design, you know, by bringing out those natural resources within himself. You know, but you can go to the other side of that and go with someone like von Clausewitz, Carl von Clausewitz, you know, in his book on war, you know, that was based on experience. So that's really what I'm talking about here. It's one thing to become philosophical about the human condition and what it is to be a man and otherwise or a warrior, but it is an entirely different thing to give that practical application. And that's the key from a designer specific approach as opposed to one size fits all. Bushido sounds good. But most samurai did not practice Bushido because they were incapable of it. Oftentimes, psychologically, their arrogance got in the way of that, which is understandable when you understand the human condition. I'm, I don't mean to get off track here. I realize that I'm no, scientifically. No, you're not. Actually, it, actually, it's, it's tapping into something that I want people to understand is okay. uh, that, that you've got, there's one thing to talk about it. You know, and, and there are a lot of people in my world that talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's <clears throat> like I, I try to tell, like, oftentimes myself and my instructors will be talking about some some parts of the training that we're doing, and it can get pretty, pretty esoteric. But the only reason it has any validity is because of the time we put in the mats, and you know, we actually put the time in, and we know. So these talks can mean something. Whereas, mm -hmm. whereas like what you're talking about to, to talk about a subject without actually putting the work in and experiencing it is not the same in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's, what's so interesting. You had an interesting path though, before you got in, you actually had a mm -hmm. mentor on the reservation yeah. that mm -hmm. was able to kind of instill a lot of this, this where we got a lot of questions about that too. And, you know, your, your training and mm -hmm. share, share what you want on it. But it would, one of my yeah. questions that I didn't ask you last time, would you say that mm -hmm. what you learned on the reservation, uh, would you, would you say it, it, it is a heavy or, or was, was a, a, almost a blade culture in some ways, like the blade was, the blade was, 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 mm -hmm. uh, was, was not my, the only approach, but, but it was very much, it was very much a extension of the training that you, that you got. I think so. Yes. I mean, I, I, it would be ridiculous on my part to say that everything that uh, my older walks on top taught me um, was responsible for my survival. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no question in my mind about that. I mean, I'm, I'm in my seventies now and I'm still a student of Aikido right. um, of necessity um, by way of discipline um, you know, and that requires humility. Um, and humility can't be taught. Right. It comes from life experience. That's just my opinion. But I've been in many, many battles. Um, but that does not make me all that in a bag of chips. Right. And you know, the minute that you think that you are, um, in my view, you're destined for failure, in some capacity. So going all the way back to my childhood, uh, starting at the age of 12, I was taught um, numerous styles of combat. Um, Aikido was one, but you know, a lot of people don't give a lot of credit to Native Americans in their capacity for warfare, uh, grappling, uh, club use, uh, knife use, uh, bow and arrow use, and I've used them all. That's a skill set. And that skill set is adaptive. Um, and by that, I mean that uh, it evolves, um, depending on your potential, how far you can take that skill set. And then, of course, the environment you're in, I'm obviously not going to use uh, bows and arrows in prison. You see, although it has been done. I wouldn't do it. Um, but um, my understanding of metallurgy that my, my elder taught me, uh, the fashioning of weapons, how to use those weapons. Um, but in everything that he taught me, um, whether it was um, Native American grappling or the grappling associated with the keto, um, you know, striking, um, traditional boxing, um, it was a matter, and his instruction was to me, I mean, he was a master in my mind, right. uh, because I've seen him in action. Um, but um, he always emphasized, make it your own. And I think that's critical. Again, it goes back to that designer specific component. You know, regardless of what he told, taught me by way of technique, 
you know, he was um, a five foot eight and weighed 180 pounds. You know, at the time that he was training me, I went from um, being six foot tall and 120 pounds to six foot four and 280 pounds right. um, throughout the course of that training. So my body was changing and I had to adapt to that relative to the te techniques that he was showing me um, and um, continue to do that throughout the course of my life and continue to do that to this day. You know, my body is no longer the way that it was when I was a youngster. Right. Um, you know, I'm now what's considered an old man, which is fine. I don't mind. Um, but I have to adapt and make those adjustments um, in how I approach a situation. I'd like to think that any situation that I'm in, uh, forced to encounter, uh, I approach with um, an intelligence. Um, a moral intelligence, uh, an emotional intelligence, an ethical intelligence. Um, I think all those things are critical um, because I never take and never have taken um, the idea of taking one's life uh, lightly. Um, I've avoided that my entire life successfully. And uh, I think that I can attribute that to my skill set. Um, so I'm grateful. Um, that I haven't had to do that, uh, primarily because of what my elder did te teach me. You know, um, and so far as my my own techniques, um, I don't have a problem. Sometimes, if you want to put together an exhibition, uh, we can do that. Yeah, and, that'd be really interesting to see. How yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, your, con your concepts, be. your concepts. Last time about talking about, you know, how you know he taught you, especially your movement patterns and and mm -hmm. dealing with multiple opponents. Mm -hmm. That was that was a fascinating aspect of things that yeah. you know you, you just have to you have to realize and, and so mm -hmm. many people talk about it without ever having experienced it you know i see a lot of trainings when they talk about you know quote unquote multiple opponents and it's just it's mm -hmm. ridiculous what they're teaching um I agree. and you you know you experienced um that at times it can actually be to your advantage you know oh, yeah. if you if you understand movement and you understand how humans try to try to come in it's 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 very key it's so funny a lot of what you were talking about i went i just went to a firearms course recently and it was all about movement and getting they, they talk about you know getting off the x and getting the that the movement to use a firearm correctly mimics exactly what you and i were talking about in the last conversation about you know multi-man engagements it was it was fascinating yeah it's about rhythm you see one of the first things my elder taught me was how to dance native dancing but in native dancing you're doing a wolf dance or an eagle dance or a bear dance whatever it may be and oftentimes in combat you're actually um, shape-shifting you know the characteristics of those particular animals that may be your totems whether it be bear or, but the style is what i'm talking about you see that with the chinese and so far as tiger crane whatever it may be right. they're incorporating a a stylistic modality um, usually defensively, not offensively, although there are some offensive components. You know, when you take the fire element, for instance, that's strictly offensive. But, and again, that's just philosophically. I've, I've read and, and, and heard people talk um, very eloquently about, you know, what it is. But to give that practical application is an entirely different thing. And that's where training comes in. The whole essence of training is to be prepared so that when you're confronted with the situation, it's not choreographed. You know, if, if this, then that, it doesn't happen like that. At least why it's not in my experience. Right. So that you have to have the ability naturally, rhythmically to adapt to whatever's happening and um, to make that adjustment. Um, to me, that's what combat is all about. You know, it's not just a, you know, um, a strike with the heel or with the elbow or with the knee, whatever it may be, you know, and this is the modality, you know, like in boxing, when they teach um, the bow, you know, that's an uppercut, they teach a modality with that. It's very, very stylized, and some people perfect it. I've seen it. Right. Um, but for the most part, you know, that's not what's going to work for me. I have an 82 inch reach. Um, so, you know, Close quarter combat entails something entirely different for me. I'm more apt to use my elbows as opposed to the heel of my hands or the flat of my hand. Right. And it's very rare that I'll use a fist. 
for that reason. I don't see any value in it. I see uh, the effectiveness of the strike itself is facilitated uh, better with oftentimes the heel of my hand yeah. or, or just an open hand. An open hand to the side of the head will generally drop a man. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how, uh, how that's been lost on a lot of people. Like the, mm-hmm. uh, they don't understand like, the vulnerability of the fist is just even very well-trained uh, individuals mm-hmm. still end up breaking their hands, you know, mm-hmm. when they, when they use them, especially in a, um, you know, if they use a bare fist fight or anything like that, mm-hmm. they use it in a street fight, um, <clears throat> using other parts of your body, which are far more durable, uh, mm-hmm. to deliver the strikes is, uh, mm-hmm. is something that, uh, I'm surprised, I'm surprised how it, I won't say it's rare because mm-hmm. people do, do train it, but it's not really emphasized. They, they really want to default. They want to spend a lot of time training how to make a proper fist, Mm-hmm. which, you know, I think is, is really, oftentimes I, I think it could be better trained on, you know, where to put the effort, you know, where, where to actually strike on the body to get a real result rather than trying to turn your fist into a really good meat club. Um, your, your approach to violence uh, was, you know, at this stage of the game with you, you're, you're almost like, where Musashi was at the end of his life before he wrote the, the book of five rings, he was, I believe he was 60 when he, when he hung it up and, and he went and wrote that book. Mm-hmm. Um, what was interesting, him looking back on, on his you know career and what he learned um, oftentimes it was, uh, and I've seen this theme throughout people that have very effective training that, that mm-hmm. do it oftentimes, at least while they're alive, they're not really recognized for it. They're mm-hmm. actually, and actually it's, it's put down because it is very effective and it's very direct, mm-hmm. fairly easy to learn. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you have to still apply the, the application is a difficult part. You have to actually get out there and do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but he couldn't even get his system recognized you know, during his life. He, yeah. he had one patron that, that kind of did it, but here, mm-hmm. here he is the most, and in his day, he was known as the most effective swordsman. Well, we're in uh, agreement on that. <laughs> and killer during that time. Yeah. Yet, you know, his methods were were kind of like looked down upon. And, you know, they much more flowery and ineffective and indirect methods were far more popular to actually train. And I think that's because people have a really hard time with the direct use of effective violence, you know, training it. I think it's very hard oh. for, for individuals to couple that i think they like the indirect approach to violence because somehow it makes them feel better um and and when you see somebody just step right up and do real injury to somebody and end the situation Mm -hmm. i think that's really hard for people to wrap their heads around and and, uh you know but I, i think that's where a lot of people especially if you don't have the bigger faster stronger aspect of it it's even more critical that you know how to you know injure somebody if somebody is trying to truly take you out Mm -hmm. yeah i I, i'm in complete agreement with you the idea of stylized fighting for the sake of stylized fighting uh is very impractical to me yeah you know a lot of modalities teach um what i would call a stylized form of fighting um as if that brings a sense of uh, energy say to the strike itself but you know individuals like bruce lee you know um, you know, the short punch, you know, it was a five inch punch right. and it was very, very effective. You know, there was nothing stylized. He didn't have to uh, gear up and, um, you know, uh, bring himself into that movement. It was just a fist he put out in front of the, the individual's chest and he executed the punch and that was it. Um, but particularly in close quartered fighting, but multiple attackers, it becomes critical absolutely critical to use your opponent's energy, you know, against them to facilitate your own flow, like a dance. And that's really how I see all fighting is like a dance. It's a rhythm. You know, language is the same way. If you stop and think about it, it's a rhythm. So if we take ourselves all the way back, you know, to even Paleolithic times, that's what we're talking about. Um, Not the symbolism associated with it, um, but the actual sound itself uh, represents a rhythm. And uh, these are all things that, you know, as we come through in the course of our evolution, I think we've lost. 
Um, and I think that's because we've lost the connection. Probably one of the greatest uh, regrets I have growing up is that I didn't take dance more seriously mm. and uh, gymnastics as a young kid. It, it wasn't really offered where, you know, where I lived, you know, moving around as a kid. But I have come to really appreciate and I made sure my children were trained in it um, as a basis, because I think people probably misunderstand at times they'll, they'll they'll hear you say rhythm and they'll be thinking like they have to be like these amazing dancers they don't understand the rhythm understanding rhythm and timing is so critical to combat and it, and if you understand human movement um you have such an advantage uh I, those students that have that background it's amazing how quickly i can get them you know proficient um nice. because they don't have to they don't fight their body they understand mm -hmm. the give and take they they're they, not inhibited. They're not inhibited. Exactly. That's it. The, and, and their movement is smooth. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not stutter. Like I was very, I was very much a clotting, plotting, you know, fighter when I first learned everything. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I don't want people to skip past what you just have said here, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the rhythm and the timing and everything, why that's so important. And dance does that for you, you know, really good yeah. dance instruction does that for you. Really mm -hmm. good, uh, you know, gymnastics also really helps you uh, mm -hmm. understand how to move your body correctly. And, and that timing aspect of things to be able to do it's, things. It's critical. I mean, just look at the idea of a pivot, you know, and, and what a pivot involves. Yeah. You see that that's timing and that's rhythm. Right. See in relationship to whomever your opponent is and how you execute that. So it really is a dance. I mean, if you've ever taken a weapon away from another individual, you understand the significance of timing. Yes. You see, I have. And so uh, to the point of saving my life. So I understand the significance of, of um, you know, the rhythm you're talking about, the timing you're talking about, and um, how the individual, you know, incorporates that into their own technique, as opposed to somebody else's technique. You know, that, that leads me to uh, uh, the next statement that you made uh, in the last interview that people have asked mm -hmm. about, and I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. this is a perfect segue to it. Okay. You talked about, we, we talked a little bit about how people don't understand, uh, yeah, especially new people coming into prison, you know, new, new fish, new prisoner coming in. Oftentimes they don't understand the world they're in and they don't mm -hmm. understand the communication or lack mm -hmm. thereof that, that's going on. You talked about the idea of uh, warm smile, cold heart. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to, uh, ha have you seen situations in the yards that you've been in uh, where you knew exactly what was about to go down, that, mm -hmm. that violence was about to happen and the individual on the receiving end probably had no idea. He was still trying to communicate or still trying to do things. What, how, how quickly do you have to adapt when you get into a prison, you know, like, like, like you have as a new person, how quickly do you have to understand that environment? Mm, I think it's a great question because it, 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 if you're going to survive, it has to be immediate. Yeah. Um, and the key to that is, you know, Tim, the one advantage I had is that I had encountered numerous catastrophic events in my life um, prior to going to prison. So, um, you know, plus I was a hunter. Um, so, you know, if you've ever hunted bear with a bow and arrow, you know what I'm talking about, but I've been swept over the spillway of a dam uh, with a rope tied around my waist and made my way back. But it's the idea of having dealt with catastrophic events that um, allowed for me to maintain a a level of comprehension of what I was seeing, reading people, reading body language, the significance of reading by body language. You know, way back in school when I played football, you know, the first thing they taught you was, you know, you watch the man center and that tells you which way he's going to go. <clears throat> so it, it's a component of reading body language. And it's just something really hard. You have a virtual reality already established in your brain because you've been there already. You don't have to take anything new in. So if something's out of place, you see it immediately. And it's when you see an event and you know something's going to go down. And like you say, the one individual may think that he's got this under control and, and um, 
he doesn't because you look at the other individual, his body language is telling you that within the next three seconds, he's going to make a move. And that's just a matter of reading. It's a matter of energy. You know, people think, well, you know, you can't read energy. Yes, you can. Oh. You see, and there are a number of ways to do it. Um, you know, it, it um, exposes itself um, through the person in a number of ways, whether it's finger movement, hand movement, uh, the shifting of the body, uh, the lips, if you can see the eyes, the eyes, I mean, there's just a multitude of factors that tell you that, you know, and we all know, I think, at, at, at this point in our evolution, that um, probably from 75 to 85% of communication is body language. Exactly. Um, so it's just a, really a matter of, of reading that. If you've had experience in that, then you're one up. Say you were involved in sports in school. So now you come to prison, just like I was talking about with football. So you've got one up. If you were a wrestler, you got one up, you see, because you've had to learn to read your opponent in some capacity, uh, telegraphing his moves. If you've been in the ring, you know, your opponent telegraphing his punches, uh, watching his footwork without watching it, you know, his center of gravity, which way he's going. You know, his eye movement, um, there, there are a multitude of factors. Uh, so it's just a matter of observing um, your environment in that capacity. And of course, knowing your enemy, you know, their, their potential, perceived potential. You could be initially way off base on that. You know, I've entered into altercations where I thought, boy, this is going to be tough. Only to find out that uh, it was all posturing. Right. You know, look good, but when you got right down to it, there was no substance. And and I'm grateful. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I'm grateful. Um, but you know, that is the reality. So, you know, you store that away by way of okay, what did you um pick up on? What did you perceive? What made you think that this was going to be difficult? You see, and how do you distinguish between what is posturing and what is not? What is a bluff and what is not? And that's, that's an acquired knowledge, really, is what it is. Yeah, it's, you know, in your in that environment, you have to, I mean, imagine you're mm -hmm. immersed right away, you, it's either yeah. sink or swim. What's, yeah. what's dangerous for my civilian clients is they can be, they can be lulled into, you know, this lazy approach to body language. And mm -hmm. they and you know, they get away with it all the time, it's fine, but they don't realize the one time where their body's probably screaming at them non-verbally that there's something wrong because they're not picking up. They're, they're listening to whatever's being said rather than what's actually happening. happening and yeah. they're not, they're not catching that movement of the fingers. They're mm -hmm. not catching that, you know, positioning that the person's doing or how they're flanking around you at one point. Um, and then it just becomes this, you know, nightmare for them if they even survive it after. Well, that's and because it, yeah, the person's putting them to sleep. Yeah. See, and that's, that's, that's part of the game, especially in the joint, yeah. you know, one of the, key characteristics of effectiveness is the ability to go to the yard and contend with an opponent that doesn't yet know he's an opponent and put him to sleep. Right. You see, by virtue of your dialogue, you know, your own body language, what you're projecting, what you know, he's picking up, it's putting him to sleep, he doesn't feel threatened. Right. You see, but if you're tense, you see, if you're if, if your uh, dialogue is aggressive, even assertive, um, you know, he's going to pick up on that. If your eyes are not fixed and um, calm, he's going to pick up on that. You see, if you <laughs> obviously, if you've taken a bladed stance, you're going to put him on notice. Yeah. You see, so you want to be relaxed, shoulders rounded, hands at your seat, side, you know, hands, arms at your side, hands not moving. You see, maybe tilt your head to the side. It's kind of a relaxed gesture. You know, it's kind of like, what's up, homie? How you doing? And um, see, he's yeah, not picking yeah. up anything. And then the next thing you know, you're making your move. Right, right. And that, that's what's key with it. Um, to transition back to interacting with law enforcement and, mm -hmm. and where they're doing I got a couple of uh, law enforcement people that... Uh, well, actually, a lot that saw our last interview. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're very curious. They're actually, they actually, and a lot of them aren't even involved in corrections, mm -hmm. but they see the value of the intelligence potential. 
And so the questions they were asking were, where, where's, where are the biggest opportunities for law enforcement to use counterintelligence? What, how, how do you approach that? What kind of conversations do you have? And then I'm kind of curious, we talked a little bit about it, but I think in some ways there was a, uh, there was a, a uh, opportunity lost when you left the gang and the way law enforcement kind of utilized you in, in some ways uh, are, are where, where from your, from your vantage point, mm -hmm. Are they are they missing the, the opportunities? Well, I think by understanding uh, the reality of whatever situation that you're dealing with, that which they're told, that's what they've been made to believe, you know, that, that so-called expertise and, you know, the origins of that expertise, where it comes from, um, you know, has it been fed to them through conduits? You know, the vast majority of intelligence that's gathered is gathered from snitches and rats and informants and all these other things that are actually looking for something relative to um, what law enforcement is after. So they're actually telling them what they want to hear. Uh, I've had that happen so many times. Um, you know, the idea of uh, polygraphy, you know, the, the utilization of polygraphy um, has very little value. Um, you know, all those things, whether it be voice analysis, polygraphy, whatever it may be, they can be beat um, by somebody that has actually trained themselves um, to beat it. Um, you say, oh, you have to be a psychopath, you have to be a sociopath. No, you don't. Right. No, you don't. You just have to develop a modality that will do that. You know, intelligence and counterintelligence is the same way. So it's, it's really understanding the reality of what you're dealing with, whom you're dealing with, what's real and what's not, what's being projected, and what's a facade, um, you know, and that takes uh, research, you know, into the, the, the factors. It's, it's reading this, not only the situation, but the individual. Um, and that comes from experience. You know, I've known some law enforcement that, um, man, were really good, really good at just stepping into a situation, reading it accurately, knowing what they were dealing with and how to counter that on the spot. You know, that's an adaptive characteristic that comes from experience. You know, not everybody's going to have that. So, you know, the use of intelligence, I think, is very, very important. How you counter that is an entirely different thing. You know, what's your objective? You see, I understood the objective in intelligence being gathered by law enforcement in the arena that I was in. And um, so I was able to understand how I could effectively um, counter that and did so, you know, by feeding them misinformation, you know, and that information coming around. And then that was the foundation of their approach to the group, uh, strategically, tactically, and, in, and with, within any planning. So while they were over here doing this, we were over here doing this right. and still feeding that. Go ahead. You know, I'll give you this many people for you to contend with. You'll be a success in what you're doing. Meanwhile, I've got this going on over here. Right. Kind of you'll, like you'll, you'll strategically give, give them something oh, yes. uh, and give up something that yes. they'll, they'll call the claim a victory because the yes. whole time they don't realize the bulk of what you're doing is over here oh, yeah. because that you've been be, feeding their snitches. That's right. That can be discovery of knives. And they're thinking, oh man, we scored, right. you know, it can be a drug clavo, you know, it can be an escape attempt, you see, and they're, they're being fed, you see, they're getting what they need relative to not just their job security, but their purpose and so far as what they're doing. But meanwhile, you've got something far more significant and substantial going on over here on the right. It's like holding up your left hand and wiggling your fingers and you get their, 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 their eyesight on that. And then you hit them with the right hand. You see, cause they've got their eyes focused on that left hand. But, and the thing about, particularly in the prison system, as it relates to the utilization of counterintelligence is that it has its limitations. And it's understanding that it has its limitations. Um, and so um, using that in whatever capacity you can, uh, but it's like in business, when you cut your losses, you know whether or not something is viable or not, because you know your environment. And the thing to remember about law enforcement within that environment, or even on the street, you see, whatever area they're coming into, that's your territory, not theirs. 
And so they're at a disadvantage. They've been trained tactically how to approach that. You see, via the utilization of backup, whatever it may be. Um, they incorporate um, informants strategically. I get it. It has its value. Um, but it's really understanding the hierarchy of what you're dealing with. Um, and by that, I mean your opponent. Yeah. And, and what that opponent is all about, what they're doing, um, their level of intelligence, their level of experience, the resources available to them. How far will they go? Is there a, a stopping point for them? You see, or is it all or nothing? You see, and that would determine my approach to that and how I feed counterintelligence to that. Um, so again, it's not, I don't want to sound like I'm beating the dead horse, but it's not one size fits all. And right. too often that's the approach in any training that law enforcement receive, you know, it's regimented, it's regimented, um, you know, it's structured, it has rules that they have to adhere to, you know, there's a, a code that they have to follow by way of, you know, ethics, you see, and it's so because of that, it's predictable. And because it's predictable, I now know what I'm dealing with, but I will make allowances for, you know, the maverick, the individual that's not going to adhere to that code, that's going to step outside the box. So you always make allowances for that. But for the most part, you're dealing with a very predictable situation and people insofar as what they will do strategically, tactically, and otherwise. Interesting. What, mm -hmm. um, the other question they asked was, and again, these aren't guys in the system because I don't, I, don't, I got the idea that they didn't get useful answers when they asked questions like this. But one of the questions, uh, that, that they had asked was, where do you see now, like, like from where the gang situation was when you got out, mm -hmm. um, what are the biggest changes in there? It, it seems like, uh, you know, you, you kind of had an ethos that you were, you were trying to instill and that's mm -hmm. why you left because they, mm -hmm. they, they, they went off of that. Where do you see like the leadership of, of the, of the larger prison gangs now? Is it, is it just more chaotic? Is it more violent? Are they more strategic? What, what, what are the, what's the current, what, what would you, what would be your opinion or your read on the current situation of, of uh, gangs in the prisons? And Depends on who you ask and who you're talking about. The Texas Aryan Brotherhood is paramilitary and uh, far more trained um, than those in Arizona, for instance, or uh, Nevada, um, particularly when you get back east. Um, so it depends on their leadership, of course. Uh, but by my estimation, in general, other than that paramilitary aspect, because that carries over into the militia, and um, other type of uh, organizations, um, which is really the foundation uh, for these so-called hate groups, right. you know, the white, the white supremacy and hate groups, you know, to my way of thinking, I would deal with that entire situation differently than it's being dealt with. But that's just me, because I understand them and where they're coming from. But to answer your question, I'm of the opinion that the gangs at this point have devolved. And by that, I mean that, whereas let's go back to the origins of my association with the gangs. It was about drugs. It was about dealing in drugs. You had some extortion going on, some pimping and pandering and that whole thing there, but it was towards generating revenues for the purposes of more drugs right. and that lifestyle. So that's really what we're talking about here is a lifestyle. Um, and so I, by my estimation, they have devolved. That does not mean that they're stupid. You know, it does not mean that, um, um, they are not a force to be reckoned with. You have some individuals that are associated with these hate groups that are former military, very intelligent, that right. know their stuff. And um, those are typically their leaders, you know, for that reason. But that vulnerability is across the board. I'll give you a very brief example. In 1984, um, the um, Sheriff's Department came at me with the idea of putting myself in the place of a VIP, um, a foreign dignitary, um, for the purposes of the Olympic Games. So they put together their convoy and their air support, and they made me that dignitary, and they took me out, and they wanted me to critique it. 
almost immediately I understood that their air support had to be refueled given the, 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 the pattern that they were using, the path that they were using. And sure enough, I knew exactly where that refueling was going to occur. So I set out snipers relative to that convoy, pulling up and waiting for their air support to be refueled. And when they attempted to combat the snipers associated with that, they had um, short order arms and nothing but. They had nothing, they had shotguns, you see, and it just didn't do the trick. Um, but so my, my point is, is that was an assumption based on their perception of the caliber of individual that they were dealing with. Um, you know, what they expected, I don't know. I know that they didn't like my final analysis, nor did they like the result at, the, at, the, at the, that point of the convoy, because they received hell from their superiors, um, because I put it in writing. Um, so I, I never, I never understood that. I've, I've dealt with a lot of things in the military. A lot of times we call it red selling and stuff like that. And I saw that, mm -hmm. and I would see commanders get really pissed off at, at, uh, you know, a negative report rather than I would think being thankful. Oh, yes. I get it. I get that 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 you know sometimes you know the, these organizations. It's all about the inner politics and everything. But the reality of doing the job, wouldn't you rather run a dry dry run like that, have everything exposed? and you know and then make your adjustments i mean if you're smart if you're smart in your leadership you'd want to do that all the time you'd want well, to know what doesn't work yes what is um, your primary interest yeah i mean effectively what are you after here a, a successful successful endeavor whatever that may be whether that's protecting the president and that's actually what this detail was a part of right. the president's protection but um um you know and, and that doesn't make me all that in a bag of chips you know, I don't, I didn't take it competitively. I was asked to critique, critique it. And I did, Yeah. but I used my own Intel to do so. Right. My Intel, by the way, were the, my handlers, you see, who happened to be on the detail, but they were also my handlers. Right. So I manipulated that information out of them. You see, yeah. and, you know, and that's really what we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. And, and that's, that's a, it's a, it's a really uh, positive way to use Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of intelligence. I mean, I just think mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. Well, listen, the final question I'll hit you up with here mm -hmm. is, is more of a, a historical there that you'd mentioned in our last interview, uh, mm -hmm. two individuals that are pretty much known to history. You mentioned uh, um, Sirhan Sirhan and you mentioned mm -hmm. um, uh, Charlie uh, Nansen. Nansen. Sorry, I don't just escape my name. Mm -hmm. But Manson, both of them. It's understandable. What people, people had questions about it. I mean, it, it, Manson, they they were interested in. He's been he's been uh, touted as you know when he was in prison as uh, being uh, you know protected as far as the feds were concerned and that in and out and all, all that. I, I think it'd be more interesting. I, I know it a lot. I know that you guys used his organization to mm -hmm. uh, to to mule some stuff. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And on the Sirhan Sirhan side. People know very little about him and mm -hmm. very little about what he is and just any impressions you have about about, you know, him and do you, you know whether or not you think he was actually able to um, it, it, was, was he a sole operator? Did you get the idea he was incapable of something like that? I don't believe that he was a sole operator. I had many, many conversations with Sir Han Sir Han, intelligent man, um, a little too heavy on the philosophical side. Um, and he had his uh, idiosyncrasies, I guess, like we all do. Right. But he was, for the most part, aloof. But uh, he really enjoyed talking philosophy. And so we would sit at the table. I was with him for 10 years. Mm. Um, so, you know, we had quite a few conversations. We had our, we locked horns on a few occasions. You know, I don't, um, regardless that a female is a law enforcement officer, it's still a female. Right. So the idea of uh, masturbating in front of her, for instance, I don't hold with, right. it's disrespectful. Right. And so I had to check him a few times on that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, to answer your question about whether he was acting alone, perhaps the best way to answer that is in relationship to 9-11. Now, Sirhan and Sirhan and I were the only ones in the unit that didn't have televisions by choice. And just before 9-11, he got a visit. And um, he didn't get too many visits. 
but he got a visit and he came back and he requested a television. And the reason he requested a television is that his visitor had come to tell him that 9-11 was going to happen. And he wanted to watch it on TV. Interesting. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. Not very many people know that. Yeah. Um, but that's a fact. Um, you know, you may get denial on up the line. I mean, I've dealt with the Secret Service as it relates to Charlie Manson. And, and um, look, Charlie Manson was a punk. Right. You know, he, the media made him. And he was a punk and a pedophile. Yeah. Um, I had far more regard for the women that he manipulated. And I understand how he was able to manipulate them because they were far more courageous. But, you know, I spent 10 years with Charlie too. And, you know, he had um, like choreographed um, episodes that he would use depending on who was interviewing him. And he would just, you know, pull that one off the shelf and insert it and, and he would go off on this tangent, but it was all choreographed, every bit of it, right. like, a, like a song, you see? And he never deviated from that. You'll notice that when he was asked questions, he didn't answer the questions. You know, he would go off onto some tirade about something or other. You know, the idea of uh, promoting uh, um, a racial war, you know, um, I, when I called Charlie a punk, I mean it literally. Uh, he was very fond of black men. And it was right. not uncommon to see one in front of him and one behind him right. um, to give you an understanding of that. Um, you know, I was in contact with um, his organization. I used his women uh, for our organization. Um, you know, I've talked to Squeaky From on the phone about Charlie while Charlie's there. Uh, I provided protection for Charlie. Um, you know, I was even accused of of um, contriving uh, the allegation that Charlie had threatened the President of the United States. Um, there was no contrivance in that. Charlie threatened the President of the United States every day. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was a very, very silly man, but he played on that. Um, and he played on it to the extreme. Right. But right. Um, as human beings go, um, he's not high up there on my list. Right. Um, you know, not just because of the crime that he committed against uh, Sharon Tate and the Long Bianca uh, folks and, and others, but um, because of who I knew him to be as an individual, uh, he had no character, uh, none whatsoever. He had no sense of, uh, of morals, um, you know, even right and wrong. Uh, he was so spoiled by the media, um, you know, that, that carried over into his existence within prison. And it developed in him an expectation that everyone should treat him that way, as if he were a celebrity. Right. Um, I didn't look at it that way. You know, the, um, you know, I walked out into the visiting room one day and one of his followers uh, had her child with her and the child was underneath the table uh, with Charlie. And I walked over and picked him up, literally picked him up and walked him back out into the uh, uh, staging area and hung him on a hook. And left him there and walked back in and told the guard his visit's over. Um, and it was. Wow. But uh, this was just, uh, uh, you know, you can probably tell it's a pet peeve with me. Oh, yeah. Nice. But Sirhan, I'd be honest with you, I had a respect for his intellect. Um, but there's, based on our conversations, there's uh, no doubt in my mind that he was not acting alone. Um, he, um, other than that, was aloof. Interesting. Um, I can't think of anybody else that he did to actually talk to. Um, but um, we had some, some good conversations. And uh, like I said, when 9-11 happened, they came in and they got him because they realized what had happened wow. and locked him up. Now, whether or not they cleared him, I don't know. I don't care. Right. Um, but I know the facts of the situation. Uh, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Michael, I know you're going, you have your own issues that you're dealing with right now and everything. Are you, uh, how is it, how is it going as far as uh, <clears throat> your goal to, to, to continue to help people as they're making their transitions and getting out and dealing with, you know, addictions and, and, you know, doing the work basically that you mm -hmm. want to do. Thanks for asking, Tim. It is, you know, I've had uh, a few hookups, a few speed bumps in the road. 
Yeah. Um, that's more political than anything else. And, um, you know, I'm a firm believer in um, my direction, have been for many, many years. Um, you know, you're always going to have uh, jawjackers. You know, you're always going to have people talking out the side of their neck for their own reasons. I don't get into that. I don't defend my position or anything else. I genuinely am interested in helping other people deal with uh, incarceration. Um, you know, more importantly, not the person that's been incarcerated, but their families. Yeah. They're the ones that suffer. Right. The communities are the ones that suffer. You know, I'm an alcohol and drug counselor and, and I do that. Um, but as I grow older, mm, I think my opinions stiffen, you know, particularly as it relates to the idea of choice, the idea that everyone has a choice. And with addiction, I'm a firm believer that you have to come of your own volition. And when you're ready, you will. But until then, that individual is going to suffer, his family is going to suffer, the community is going to suffer. And um, so now I'm looking at the idea as a biologist of uh, epigenetics. I'd like to get deeper into that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm putting out my own book relative to educating the public about prison and uh, my own life experiences. And I hope that has some value. I want to talk about violence. I want to talk about incarceration, um, you know, and, and those things that are important to me. Um, I, I believe in this country with all my heart. I am an American and um, strong in my convictions, my principles and my beliefs. Um, and that will remain so. Uh, so that um, while I understand that um, I have to deal with the system right now, the truth of the matter is I believe in the system. Um, and I'm going to continue to believe in the system. Um, I think it's important. Uh, I'm blessed in that I have friends who support me. I have a wife who loves me, supports me, and provides me with that guidance that is necessary toward maintaining my own humanity. And uh, that's critical to me. Um, so I think to answer your question, um, I'm doing quite well. That's great. And, uh, it, it is, yeah. I'm blessed. I wake up every day grateful. After 45 years in prison, how could I not? Uh, it's just that, I mean, it's, it's got to be, that That alone has to be great. I was, I was happy that, you know, that that was able to uh, continue for you and that, that's continuing now. Well, I want to tell you publicly, Tim, that I appreciate you. Oh, thank you, man. I, I listen, I, 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 I have really appreciated getting to know you and, mm -hmm. uh, and having these conversations with you. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I do believe that, uh, you know, I, I believe that because of your past, you're going to, you know, some people were very upset that you got let out and mm. I think they're going to try to make it, you know, difficult for you on that. And I, I support it, but I just think what you're sharing with people is really mm -hmm. important. Uh, what you shared in the past before you got out, it was great stuff. And um, I, I'm hoping that, you know, when your book's done, we'll definitely have you back on for that and get that it out great. there. And, um, yeah. and also I'll let everybody know as soon as your channel's up, cause you're gonna be doing your own channel and probably yeah. podcast, mm -hmm. which I think is great. I think you got a lot to offer. So uh, Thank you. I, I just wish you all the best and um, Thanks, I'll look forward to our next conversation. I do too. You take special care. Thank you, sir. Hey, thanks for watching. If you do like this content, make sure that you have subscribed to the YouTube channel. But also, if you want to see everything that I put out, everything uncensored, straightforward, not squelched by big tech, also join our Rumble channel. It's all down in the show notes. That way you get everything that I put out. Unfortunately, Big Tech has put a crunch on me being able to get this information to you. That's why I created the alternative channel with Rumble. Also, if you are ready to start training right away, please go to timlarkin.com, sign up for our free masterclass, and start putting together a plan that will minimize the chance of violence coming into your life and your family's life. Thanks again for watching, and please support the channel.